Well, good morning, Quorum Dale. I love you guys. I, I was just sitting in the back during worship thinking about how great my job is um, because I get to see God do really amazing things over time in people's lives. And so I was just thinking about how uh, thankful I am, how much of a grace to me it is, uh, the team that was up here leading worship, the creative team that put that video together, uh, even being able to commission a new missional community and Jason, Miranda, and I were in the same missional community a few years ago, and so it's just really cool to see them be moved out to lead a new one. And so it's just a lot of fun uh, to serve alongside you guys and to have the privilege of teaching the Bible here and, and pastoring here. Um, it's a lot of fun what I get to do. And um, it's a lot of fun what we get to do. And so I just want to echo what Paul said, that if you're here and you're not yet a part of a missional community, um, here's what you need to know. That... Um, it's the primary structure in our church by which we do almost everything. And so as um, elders, we're responsible to shepherd the flock, but the primary way that shepherding actually plays out is in the context of missional communities. And so if you're not a part of one, um, it makes it really hard for you to be cared for like you need to be, for you to be using the spiritual gifts you have the way you need to be, uh, for, for you to be um, shaped in all the ways that God wants you to be. And so I just want to sort of personally urge you um, don't hang out out there and not move toward connecting to a missional community. This is a great season in the life of our church for you to do that. And really, if you're going to be a part of things here and be well cared for here, um, that, that's really crucial, just even in how we've designed the church to work. So that's my, um, my calling to you, my urging to you to connect to a missional community. There are um, two ways to read the Bible and two ways to read the story of your own life. You can either see it as a story about you or us in which God plays a small part, or you can see it as a story about God in which you play a small part. And that makes all the difference, doesn't it? All of us start out in the first category. We have a tendency to read the Bible and to read the narrative of our own lives as primarily a story about me. And God may be a, a big player or a small player in the story, but the story is really about me. What God wants to do is to change the way you read the story. God wants to give you a new set of glasses, a new pair of lenses to look through. That's what the gospel really is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a new way of seeing it's a message that doesn't change so much what you see as it changes how you see. So how is it that God brings about this change? How does God impart to us this new way of seeing? How does God bring the truth of the gospel to bear on us in a way that changes what we see? The simple answer to that question is a word you may not have thought much about before. It's simply the word means. Here's how the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it. God, in his ordinary providence, makes use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at his pleasure. Here's what that means. It means that when the sovereign God of the universe wants to do things in your life, the way he's going to do them is by using means, by using everyday things and circumstances and people. So for example, if God wants in his sovereign goodness to bring you to faith in him, the means by which he does that might be a person you work with who starts to talk with you about the gospel, invite you into studying the Bible. Or if God wants to grow you as a Christian, the means by which he's going to do that will be things like the Bible and the church, the people of God. God, in his ordinary providence, in his ordinary ways of governing the world, uses means. And one of God's means, in fact, one of his primary means, is community. God wants to use the people around you to shape you, to grow you, to bring you into contact with Him and with His gospel. 
And so part of becoming a gospel-centered community, which is the thing that we're thinking about together in this series, part of becoming a gospel-centered community is embracing the way that community forms us in the gospel. The way that people are one of God's means to reveal our sin, to reveal God's goodness, and to help us revel in His grace toward us. And the reason it's important for us to just step back and think about God using people as one of His means is because it's sometimes a hard thing for us to see. Because we are, after all, Americans. And in our culture, there's a great emphasis on the individual. This country was birthed on rebellion, right? And self-determination. That's what makes us who we are. The water that we swim in culturally is water that tells you really things are primarily about who you are as an individual and how you're going to get where you want to go in life. And so when you come to faith in Christ and you become a Christian, you import those same assumptions into your following of Jesus. So the way that plays out is we tend to think primarily about my personal relationship with God. That's the lens through which I think about spiritual formation And I sometimes rarely, if ever, think about how God is using the people around me to grow me, to challenge me, to shape me, to reveal things about himself to me. There's one of Jesus' disciples who I think would have made a really good American. His name is Peter. And Peter is the rugged individualist of the disciples, If there's one of the disciples who sort of captures the American ethos of the individual, it's Peter. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to look at a defining moment in Peter's life that changed the way he saw the world. We find it in Luke 22. It's the passage you already heard read. And so if you have a Bible or if you have an app, I want you to go there now. We're going to to study this passage together. Let me set the context for what's going on. This is the Last Supper. It's Jesus' last Passover meal with his disciples. He's shortly going to be betrayed, handed over, and crucified. And So this is sort of his last intimate gathering with his closest friends and followers on the way to his passion and death. And because Jesus is a good shepherd, to the very end, He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about the sheep. He's thinking about his followers. And and he knows this is an intimate moment with his disciples. One of his last opportunities to impart to them wisdom. To demonstrate his care and concern for them. And so one of the things he does in this moment is to speak a personal word to the Apostle Peter. We find it in Luke 22 verse 31. Jesus addresses Simon Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Hey, Simon, listen, behind the surface of your life, there's a great cosmic struggle going on that you may not even be aware of. Did you ever think about that in your life, Behind the veneer of your daily existence, there's a cosmic conflict between good and evil. There's a kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan that that lies underneath the sort of very common everyday life that you live. Jesus is sort of pulling the curtain back for Peter. He's saying, Peter, in the midst of your discreet decisions that you're going to make over the next few days, I want you to see Satan's after you. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus right now, if you're a Christian, is praying for you. Romans 8 tells us that Jesus is interceding for us at the right hand of God. Jesus prays for His disciples. And Jesus' prayers never go unanswered. This is a word of reassurance to Peter in the midst of what he's facing. Notice what he says next. And, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. 
Jesus is hinting here at the ministry that Peter is going to have. The fact that Peter is going to be a leader among the apostles. One of the key figures in the early church. He's hinting that Peter's going to have a ministry of strengthening, of leading, of encouraging the people of God. Peter, verse 33, said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Doesn't he sound like a great action movie hero? Jesus, wherever you go, prison, death, I'm in. And this is why I love Peter. Because he's all in. Right? There's no sense of like half-hearted kind of, I mean, whatever, Jesus. He's all in. This is the heart of a disciple, right? If you love Jesus here this morning, this is how you feel. Like, look, Lord, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, I'm all in. I'm all in with you. Peter has this wonderful heart of devotion. Here's the only problem. He lacks a gospel self-awareness. He doesn't understand his own weakness. He's not yet seeing rightly. See, Peter's self-estimation is still, he still sees himself in the category of the courageous, the brave, the one who's going to help Jesus fix the world. He doesn't yet see that he's actually the coward, the weak, the one who needs to be fixed. How are you like Peter this morning? In what ways are you too strong to see your weakness? Too proud to see your frailty? And even more importantly for the series that we're in, how is your view of community similar to Peter's? Do you notice Peter's not even thinking about the rest of the 11 disciples? Jesus, I'm with you. Come prison, come death, I'm in. Don't know about these other guys. Jesus is aware of the other disciples. He's just said to Peter, hey, strengthen your brothers. Jesus' concern is for the whole community of his followers, but but it's like those people are background players for Peter in the grand drama of his personal relationship with God. Is that how you approach community? That it's, it's kind of really about you and Jesus. The other people around you are sort of dispensable. Is church for you a community or a commodity? Is it a people you belong to? Or is it a dispenser of religious goods and services? Do you tend to evaluate church The way you evaluate another consumer good. Is it meeting my needs? Is it getting me where I want to go? Does it serve me well? It seems that that's how Peter was sort of estimating and evaluating the other disciples. But Jesus knows Peter and Jesus loves Peter. And Jesus knows you and he loves you. Jesus knows that what Peter needs is a new way of seeing. He needs a new set of glasses. He needs a complete reorienting of how he sees himself and how he sees Jesus and how he sees Jesus' work in the world. Verse 34. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, The rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Now many of you know the rest of the story and so you're already skipping ahead and anticipating the events that will follow but I want want you to stop right here and just catch what Jesus is doing. Jesus is right here setting Peter up. There's something that Jesus wants to do in Peter's life. There's something that Satan wants to keep from happening in Peter's life. And what Jesus is doing is he's setting up the events that are going to follow 
in order to create a defining moment for Peter. He, Jesus is using means to teach Peter, to open Peter's eyes. He's going to use the means of denial and a rooster crowing to teach Peter something way more important and way more foundational about who he is and who God is. Nothing that happens from here on in the story is accidental. It's the sovereign hand of a sovereign God providentially working in the world to shape and form one of his disciples. So supper ends. Night falls. Jesus goes with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's betrayed. A mob comes and arrests him. The disciples flee and scatter. Verse 54. Then they seized him, that is Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. I brought along a photo of what a a courtyard of a Middle Eastern house would have looked like. And so you can see behind the columns in sort of the colonnade area is probably where Jesus was along with the people who had arrested him, the chief priests, the sort of official figures. And then there would be this sort of courtyard area where there would be a fire and probably a few dozen bystanders and hangers-on and people who were interested in the outcome of events are hanging around in the courtyard. So there's not hundreds of people here, but probably dozens and Peter's there among them, sort of hanging in the back, following at a distance. Verse 56. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Not a little white lie from Peter, not a sort of avoid the question, but a blatant, all-out lie. I don't even know this guy. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly This man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. The Galileans had a distinctive accent, and so you could tell who was from Galilee by the way they spoke. It's sort of like if you were to go out in the hall this morning after church and someone walked up and said, Cheerio, chap! Jolly good day we've had today! And you would say, you're not from here, are you? There's just, by the way a Galilean spoke, it clued people in, this, this person's from a different part. And Jesus was a Galilean, and Peter was a Galilean, and so this guy's listening to Peter talking, he's going, oh, you're from Galilee, obviously you know this guy. Verse 60, but Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, The rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you put yourself in the story right here? Can you imagine this moment? When when your eyes meet Jesus' eyes. When Jesus in the colonnade turns and makes eye contact. It's a look that punctuates the moment. It's an intentional look. It's, I think, a loving look, but also a convicting look. Jesus turns and he looks at Peter as if to say, That's what I was talking about. The rooster crows, their eyes meet, and the text tells us, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. 
It's as though we're supposed to see that Peter's so caught up in the moment, he, he's so uh, not even aware of what's going on, that he's just denied Jesus three times, and he's not even counting in his head, he's not even aware of what's happening. And then the rooster crows, and Jesus looks, and it all comes together. And he remembers what Jesus had just said hours before. Verse 62, and he went out and wept bitterly. Why? Because he had denied Christ, certainly. He's heartbroken over his denial of the Savior, but I think Peter's probably also weeping bitterly because he's seeing reality for the first time. Right here, he's realizing he's not the hero. He's not going to be a hero. He's not going to follow Jesus to the death. In fact, the reason Jesus is going to death is for him. It's all coming clear to him now. He's not the strong one, the brave one, the courageous one. He's the fool. He's the denier. He's the failure that Jesus is lovingly laying down his life for. Jesus had known that all along. Jesus is not surprised. But see, Peter was too proud and too self-confident to see it, but now he saw it. And can't you see that as soon as Peter saw all of that, it would have also changed how he saw the people around him. The servant girl who a few moments ago had threatened to blow his cover was in fact a gift from the Lord Jesus to reveal his self-reliance. The bystander who had made fun of his accent was really a gracious reminder of his affinity with the Lord Jesus. The other disciples who ran away, who didn't even go to the courtyard because they were more scared, they were no more cowardly than Peter. They were his brothers whom he was going to be called to strengthen. And who he would allow to strengthen him. God, in his ordinary providence, makes use of means. God, in Peter's story, is using means, people, circumstances. To bring him face to face with the reality of the gospel. And when the rooster crowed, Peter saw. He saw the whole world differently. And if you're familiar with the rest of your Bible, the Peter we see in the book of Acts, the Peter who wrote the epistles of 1 and 2 Peter, is a different man. A more humbled man. A more chastened man. A more human man. A more gospel-saturated, gospel-formed, grace-transformed man. Because when the rooster crowed, he saw. So here's the question for you this morning. Has the rooster crowed in your life? Has Jesus turned and looked at you And if so, has his look changed the way that you look at community, at the people around you? See, before the rooster crows in your life, your tendency will be to see relationships as functional. Your primary concern will be how they work and whether they work to your benefit. And here's how you can catch yourself doing this. It's when you catch yourself in your self-talk using economic metaphor. Saying things like this. Is this relationship worth it? Is this missional community a good investment of my time? 
Is the cost of having that neighbor over for dinner something I can afford? It's an economic calculation about relationships that keeps you at the center. Everything is a cost-benefit analysis that either benefits you or costs you. The criteria by which you evaluate things is how it functions for you. How the relationships in your life function for you. But see, once the rooster crows in your life, it changes how you see. You begin to realize the story isn't about you, it's about Jesus. The people around you are put there by Jesus to shape you and for you to shape them. The circumstances in your life are the raw materials God is going to use to bring you to a deeper understanding of the gospel, a deeper apprehension of his goodness, a deeper sense of his grace. The conflicts, the friction, the petty squabbles in your relationships are the raw materials God is using to build in you humility, courage, faith, love, joy, persistence. God's forming you into a certain kind of person. And he's using the people around you as his means. And so when the rooster crows in your life, economic metaphor and categories give way to formative categories. You find yourself asking questions like this. What does God want to teach me through this person? How is the Holy Spirit shaping me through this community? What does God want me to see about Him through the people around me? How is He showing me Himself and helping me worship Him more deeply through the people around me? Before the rooster crows in your life, You'll tend to approach church in the same way, economically. You'll tend to have a consumeristic sort of grid for thinking about a church. So here's the kinds of questions you'll find yourself asking. Do I see a lot of people like me here? Do they have a good children's ministry or youth ministry or women's ministry, whatever? Do I like what they have to offer me? Does this church meet my needs? Does it scratch my itch? Does it fit my preferences? But once the rooster crows in your life, it changes how you see. You begin to ask questions like, how does God want to form me through these people? How might they be a means of God's grace in my life? How might their weaknesses and their failures help me see more of Christ? And how might their strengths help strengthen me as a disciple of Christ? This is what it means to be a gospel-centered community. It means the gospel shapes our community, and it also means the community that we're a part of shapes us in the gospel. It means God uses people as his means to form us in our understanding of who he is, who we are, and what Christ has done for us. Has the rooster crowed in your life? Here's what that might mean. For some of you, the rooster crowing in your life is the the moment of conversion. For some of you, the rooster's crowing in your life this morning, meaning Jesus is looking at you and you're seeing for the first time the reality of who you are and who he is. The reality that you're not the self-sufficient American individual who's going to live a heroic life, but rather you're weak, you're needy, you're self-absorbed. You need a savior. You need a healer. You need a deliverer. You need one to restore you and redeem you. For some of you, that's becoming clear for the first time this morning. But there's others of you here this morning that that the rooster crowing in your life is, is more like what it was for Peter, meaning you're already a disciple or a follower of Jesus, but you're not self aware. So so though you would profess to follow Jesus and though you would say you're a disciple and though you're all in with him. You're still individualistic in how you think. 
You still think in economic metaphor. People around you are still sort of set dressing for the great drama of your personal relationship with God. And and this morning, maybe Jesus is looking at you. Maybe you're seeing him look at you and provoke the question in you. Are you really seeing things rightly? Or might it be that the people that God has put around you are part of His means to shape you, to form you, to deepen you? Might it be that He's going to accomplish in you this morning a new way of seeing? Once you've turned, strengthen your brothers. Strengthen your sisters. Build community. Help others grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't about you. This isn't your story. It's God's story. And the beauty of what Jesus does is He helps us to see the reality of the story we're actually in. So that like Peter, we can just acknowledge our folly. And the beauty for us is because we live on this side of the cross... It doesn't have to be bitter. It doesn't have to move us to weep bitterly. It can move us to bittersweet joy. Because we see the very foolishness in us, the very selfishness, self-centered, individualist, me-centered approach to life that we're prone to is the very thing Jesus came to die for and change. The only way we become a different kind of person is by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you this morning, has the rooster crowed in your life? Has Jesus looked at you? And has his look changed the way that you look at and see the people around you? You are not the heroic, self-sufficient individual who's going to help the Lord Jesus fix the world. You're the needy, weak, broken disciple whom he came to fix, to redeem. And once you've seen that, it changes everything. Life is not a story about you in which God plays a small part. Life is a story about God in which you have the great privilege of playing a small part. Let's pray together. Thank you, God. For disciples like Peter, because he's a lot like me. Thanks that you give us in the Bible, not just yourself and a revelation of who you are, but you give us real people that we can relate to. That in their folly, we can see our own folly. And in their selfishness, we can see a mirror held up to show us our selfishness. And thank you that this morning our hope is not in Peter, but in the Lord Jesus. Thank you that Peter's hope could never be in Peter, but only in you. And so we want to ask this morning that you change the way we see. I pray for some of us that the, that the rooster would crow for us in our lives this morning. That this would be the morning that you awaken us to the reality of who we are and who you are and what it means to actually live in light of that. God, we just ask that you would transform us into a people who see others as part of your means to form us. That we would die to the American lie that we're going to get all our stuff together and grow up as disciples and then just minister to everyone else. But help us to see that in reality we're going to be always like Peter. (laughs) Disciples who are growing, who are seeing in new ways our need for you and your grace to us. And that our calling is to strengthen our brothers and our sisters. So make us that kind of a people. And God, for those here this morning who are not yet followers of you, not yet disciples, not yet Christians, would you this morning allow the rooster to crow in their life? Would you look at them this morning, help them see you with new eyes, open their eyes, remove their blindness, help them see reality? 
in a way that changes how they see everything else. Make us a community centered on the gospel and grow us in the gospel through the community you've put us in for your glory. Amen.